Hello, everybody. Welcome back to tracking our local shifting real estate market here in Southern New Jersey, Burlington, Camden, Gloucester counties, 900,000 and below. You get the gist by now. Today, we're going to do a little side topic as well. And it stems from a conversation I had with a gentleman last night during a buyer consultation. And I kind of have been operating under the assumption that everybody understands what the realtor does to help them buy a home. And the questions that this gentleman was asking me last night made it abundantly clear that no, not every single person understands the scope of everything that a realtor is supposed to be doing for you inside of a transaction. So we're going to run through the stats. We're starting to see a couple positive signs for the South Jersey real estate market. Um, but then we're going to just do a little quick dive into kind of what is the role of the realtor and what should you ex be expecting of your realtor? Again, would love you to use me, but if you're operating in a different state, if you end up going with a different agent, I understand. It's just a matter of here's what I'm going to lay out of what you should expect. All right. This week, the one thing I am happy to see is that we didn't keep falling in our total active listings. I mean, we fell a little bit, but only by four listings. It's basically less than a 1% change. So we kind of kept the total active listings steady. Now we had a good amount of new listings, which was fantastic, but we also had a lot of closed, or excuse me, a lot of under contract and the closed numbers are starting to increase too. Um, the expired and withdrawn canceled, this was really high. I saw that there was actually, a, I think it was 81 of this 114 was expired listings, meaning listings that had been sitting for a while and they finally said, hey, it's been three months, six months, whatever, we didn't sell the house, let's just take it off the market, let it expire and, and we'll be done with it. So the reason why that's interesting is because if we come down and look at our average and median days on market, look at what happened to the median days on market in one week. The median days on market dropped by 10 in a week. So you take 81 of those expired listings off that are pulling that up because they're all at 180 days, 180 days, 179 days, 181 days, right? Because those six month listing agreements. So those are all out. And it dropped our days on market considerably. So a lot of the old inventory has flushed out. A lot of the new inventory has flushed in. And it's really being reflected in our average and our median days on market. Okay. Now, we did have a, a decent amount of price reductions. These seem to be fa uh, holding fairly steady for us. Uh, the volume ever so slightly down, not surprising. And again, our list price, I'm pretty happy about this. It's been staying fairly flat. That I am happy to see. I don't want to see this starting to climb too soon. I'm okay with it starting to climb once we start to see the first big interest rate drops. Uh, but as of now, I would really like that to stay where it is. So actually a pretty good week. I'm still a little bit nervous about this slide that we're going in right now in terms of the total active listings we have on market. Um, just based on what's going to happen with these interest rates, I, I, I say it this way. For every seller that's going to enter the market as a buyer and put their home on the, on the market, you're going to get three other first-time home buyers that come along with them. There's not really a lot of math behind this. This is just my sense of how my business goes and how a lot of the business in our office goes and the way people talk about their business. So with every new listing that comes on, it's going to get more and more crowded with the amount of buyers who are coming on the market. And they're probably coming on the market because of an interest rate drop. Same reason why the first time home buyers are entering the market at that point. Okay. So all pretty good. Hoping to just see a, this total active listing start to rebound a lift a little bit. I'd like to keep seeing that new listings stay above 250. I think that's going to be kind of a sweet spot for us as we get into this year, but let's, let's flip gears here. Let's talk a little bit about the role of the realtor. Now, I do this not because I'm trying to highlight all the great things about realtors. That's 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 not really what this is intended to be. What I want this to be is if you are going to meet with an agent, you should have an idea of what the expectations are for them and how they should show up in your world. Realtors can become a real estate agent with 75 hours of in-class in New Jersey and two tests and about 2000 bucks. That's it. And hope, and just not being a felon. Uh, other than that, you can pretty much become an agent at any time. All you have to do is be 18. So I say that to say there are a lot of agents who are very new in the business and who just don't understand or have the experience to talk about the entire breadth and knowledge of what they should be able to give to you. So I want to go through this quickly here. I mean, we're not going to take too long, but I do want to just hit each of these eight points. So let's start with the obvious one. 
Market knowledge and analysis, realtors provide expertise on local market conditions, trends, pricing, inventory levels, comparable sales data to help clients make informed decisions. I don't know about you, but what we've been doing here uh, for over a year seems to be that. So that's that's always been my intention is that I have to be able to talk to clients about this and give them accurate information. And if I'm not tracking it in real time, now you could go the long way like I do it and track yourself. I'm okay if other realtors follow publications, follow other people who go through the economic statistics and then be able to give that back to you. I'm okay with that. They don't have to do it from scratch, but they should be aware of it, right? I find so many agents are living six months or a year in the past in the conversations that they're spouting to their clients. And the client who doesn't know any better is just going to take them at face value. So if they say it's a good market, you're going to think it's a good market. If they say it's a bad market, you're going to think it's a bad market. So it's really important that the agent is actually informed about that opinion. All right, number two property valuation. Realtors assist sell sellers in determining the appropriate listing price for their property based on market analysis and property condition, maximizing the chances of a successful sale at the best possible price. That last that last line is really what property valuation comes into. So we do property valuation for a number of things. One, I have it when people are considering getting a home equity line of credit and they just want to know, hey, can you give me a rough uh, opinion of what my value is? I have to talk to the bank and things like that. So that's called a broker price opinion. We could do that. We also do it when we're going to be listing a home, right? When we sit down and we say, hey, what should we list your home for? Now that conversation between property valuation and a listing is two pronged. One, here's the fair market value for your home. And I explain fair market value to be, if I didn't represent either the buyer or the seller, what would be the price and terms for this home where I felt as though both parties, both the buyer and the seller, were making out well in the transaction? For me, that's fair market value, okay? Now, fair market value is what I'll tell you, but that may not be, A, the price we list your home for. That also might not be the price you get, right? So in an example, I tell sellers a lot, look, fair market value for your home may be three hundred and fifty to three hundred and sixty thousand dollars based on comparables based on based on the market. However, I'd like to price your home at three forty. The reason being is because of this last sentence, maximizing the chances of a successful sale at the best possible price. Well, I know that the best way to get you that highest price is to create a bidding war. You want to have buyers bidding against each other in a blind auction in order to try and put the best price. For your home. That's the way you, through a lot of trial and error, that's the way you're going to get the best price for your home. Now, some agents may go the opposite direction. They may say, hey, fair market value for your home is probably going to be about $600,000. We're going to try it at seven twenty-five, dollars And so it may sit for a little bit, but they can kind of hope that maybe there's that one buyer who just really wanted that house and said, oh, I got to have this no matter the price, they'll come up and buy it. That you can get away with that maybe on some luxury homes and maybe some unique homes and maybe some shore, uh, like shore town homes. I'm kind of thinking like vacation rental and vacation area spots. You can sometimes get away with that. But by and large, because of Zillow, Realtor.com, buyers, other agents, we all are looking at the same data and we recognize we can tell very quickly when you're overpriced and that will turn a lot of buyers away who are already being hit at the gas pump and hit at the grocery store and hit it with inflation and hit with interest rates from an affordability standpoint. They're like, I'm not even going to bother seeing something that I think is overpriced. I'll wait till it comes down. So anyway, property valuation number two, marketing and promotion. This is a big one, right? I, there's there's kind of this uh, three P's of, of listing a property and it's, let me see if I can get this right. It's basically, we put a sign in the yard, we put it on the MLS and we pray. And that's not really a great method for marketing your home. You know, I work with the Sam Lepore group and we have a full-time videographer that works and does video, video for all of our listings. We have a full-time marketing girl that all she does is make Sam's Instagram page and do all that. And she helps all the agents like myself on the team with all the different things that we need. Some of the thumbnails I've used for YouTube, she's helped me create some of those. So anyway, marketing and promotion are really important for making sure that your listing is shown in the best possible light. The biggest example of this is professional photography, right? Social media, running ads, all those things, depending on where you live, depending on the style of your house, that could vary greatly. So this isn't going to be a marketing conversation. The single biggest thing, if your realtor comes through and says, I'm going to be taking the photos with my cell phone next Thursday, fire them immediately. That is an absolute disservice. When I do these property searches and I'm on a Google meet with a client and we're going through a couple of listings, I'll say, hey, what? Why didn't you like this one? It fits everything you want on paper. And we go through the photos and it's eight photos taken with a shaky hand camera in bad lighting. 
And they're like, oh, well, it just looked really dingy. It looked really dark. You know, I didn't, it didn't really look like for me. I was like, well, I get that, but can't you see that they're just bad photos? And they're like, no, I honestly can't see that. I honestly think that this is what the house looks like. That's on a spectrum, right? Some people are better at it. Some people are worse at it. But for the most part, this is quick. Some people are looking at these listings for all of like 10 seconds. If you can't grab them with your photos in the first 10 seconds, you've lost them. I see that all the time. Number four, negotiation skills. I'm sorry to tell you, but most people suck at negotiating. And pardon my French. I don't like to get that forward in this. If we were to actually just put a buyer and a seller in a room and have them talk to each other about the terms, there would be a lot more uh, homicides in New Jersey. And I don't know if I'm joking about that. People become very emotional. They tend to say things that A, they don't mean. B, they got caught up in the moment and they said something that was rude. A single moment of rudeness can crush you. I've had it where an agent, we're, we're in the middle of a negotiation and the agent is being snarky with me. Just, hey, has my offer been presented yet? What's going on? Blah, 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 blah. And I have to explain to the sellers to say, hey, here's the offer. But I also want to let you know, here's how the agent is acting. Here's the way that they're already showing up to the table. And the seller who says, well, I have to deal with this person for the next 30, 45 days of my life. Yeah, I have no interest in dealing with another agent who's going to be annoying like that, right? I have no interest in dealing with somebody who's going to put my feet to the fire and make be unfair and be rude and be emotional. We don't want that. So the best method is seller, tell your listing agent something. Listing agent, tell the buyer's agent. Buyer's agent, tell the buyer. And then go back and reverse course and go back and reverse course. Because as it gets to us, we take all the emotion out of it and we simply relay the facts. We just simply relay intent. We try and be transparent about what that intent is and what we're trying to achieve and to find an amicable resolution on paper. Negotiating skills is super important. And the other half of this is you should understand how to craft offers in this market. I talk about my six step system, six step system, that's a tongue twister, for presenting an offer. You have what are called your OG3 terms, and then you have three other terms that you use depending on a multiple bid situation. If you want to learn more about that, contact me. Let's have a buyer consult. Number five, transaction management. Transaction management is one of those things that I actually really enjoy because it's very systematic. That's what I love about a real estate transaction is that there are just checkpoints that we hit every single transaction. They may show up differently. They may have different things going into them, but by and large, there's some milestone decisions that we have to hit. Being able to oversee the transaction, start to finish coordinating inspections, appraisals, title searches, and other necessary steps. The other part of transaction management isn't necessarily just going to a home inspection. It's also, have I given you a really good explanation of how to get the escrow check, where to take it, how to drop it off, how to do the home inspection, give you recommendations of tried and true home inspectors, recommend title companies, explain to you what title insurance is, go through the homeowner's insurance with you, go through all of those things, review that home inspection report with you, which can be 50, 60 pages and daunting, right? That aspect of managing the transaction and making sure you hit those milestones is so important. I enjoy it because it's systematized. There's a lot of agents who end up outsourcing that. Even on our team, if you close the transaction with us, you know who Christine Turner is, right? You know who Joanne Paxson is. That's our listing coordinator is Joanne and Christine Turner is our, our transaction coordinator who she is like the quarterback when we get under in our contract to make sure every single piece of paper gets done exactly when it should. All right, number six, legal and regulatory compliance. So realtors are knowledgeable about relevant laws, regulations, contractual obligations, governing real estate transactions, ensuring all parties adhere to legal requirements and avoid potential pitfalls. When we go into this, I talk to people all the time. I said, look, you have an escrow deposit that you put down at the time of signing the contract. It's my job to make sure you never lose that. You could lose it if you breach this contract illegally, right? If you don't, if you screw around during a turn interview and you don't do something right, you could potentially lose it. If you screw around during the home inspection, you don't get your stuff in on time, or if you, if you miss something or something like that, you could inherit a problem or you could, again, not be able to get your escrow back. If the appraisal situation occurs and there's something that goes on funny and you don't negotiate it properly, there are a lot of ways inside of a transaction that the client, the buyer may have to lose their escrow in order to get out of the contract. It's my job to make sure that that never happens. And it's my job to make sure that you understand where the pitfalls are of the contract. Now, here's the big asterisk and caveat. I am not an attorney, right? My brother uh, who bought a home up in New York not that long ago, 
he had a story for me about the realtor that he was working with up there. And he, and he calls me, he goes, Connor, I feel like my realtor is just beating around the bush all the time. He won't give me a straight answer. He's always telling me some range of something. I, like, I don't know what to do. I'm about, about to fire this guy. I said, Ryan, do not fire him. He's doing exactly what he should be doing. He's not an attorney. He can't say, Ryan, you should do X, Y, and Z. You should do A, B, and C, right? He can't say you should. You should would mean he's an attorney and he actually has the legal background to advise a client on legal matters. That's not us. What we do is I call it kind of walk like a duck, talk like a duck, right? I say, hey, look, here's the deal. I'm not going to tell you exactly what you should select in this scenario, but here's what I can do. I'll show you. There are some other transactions that I've had in the past where clients did this, this, and this, and here were some of the results and here's how they went into it and what their thinking was. And then there were some other clients on the more, maybe more conservative, maybe these were the aggressive folks. These are the more conservative folks. Here's what they did and here's why they did it. So here's kind of the range and the spectrum upon which you can make this answer. Here's multiple options that you can select. Which one do you feel most comfortable with? Right? That would be a much better way as a realtor to tee up the conversation, give experience and contextual background, but ultimately you need to leave the decision. You need to leave that 51% decision to the client. So if your realtor ever says to you, you should go as is on this property, they are acting as an attorney and they also are not an inspector. They can't tell you you should or shouldn't waive your rights to a home inspection. Right? They should say, hey, based on other homes that have been in this development, there have, the inspection reports have been quite low because it's only a 15 year old community. This is a candidate where if you were to go as is, it might be a stronger offer and the likelihood that there would be damage may be lessened. However, there still is the scenario where these issues may occur. You have to be cognizant of that. You have to be aware of that and here's all the pitfalls, right? So we make sure to go through a lot of that. But again, a realtor shouldn't act as attorney. And we are in non-attorney county, so they're not required. There are other areas where attorneys are required. There's other states where attorneys are required. We are actually a little bit of an oddity here in Burlington, Camden, and Gloucester counties of New Jersey, where realtors, or excuse me, attorneys are not required to be part of the transaction. But I'm always happy to refer that out if and when we need that. All right, last two, client advocacy and support. Realtors serve as trusted advisors and advocates for their clients, providing guidance support. I just said that one, didn't I? Nope, we just said the last one. Providing guidance support and personalized assistance throughout the buying or selling process, addressing concerns and answering questions along the way. I think this is pretty straightforward, but I think I would argue this is a little bit more of the emotional side of things. This is stressful. When you buy or when you sell a home, there is stress involved. There is an entire mental health side of the real estate transaction. I think the best thing that a realtor can do in that sense is give you perspective. Another transaction we had recently in Philadelphia where there was something that got included that the seller wasn't aware. We had talked about it and a lot of things, but just the way it showed up at the end of the transaction, it, it was ended up being more than what she was originally thought of. And at the time, she wanted to say, well, screw it. We're not moving forward with the transaction. You know, we'll go a different direction. And we talked a little bit about it and we said, hey, What's the, what's the lesser of two evils here? Do we want to just kick this buyer out and go completely back on market and try again with a whole new buyer? Do you think you're going to get back that price? Do we think we're going to get back these terms? We're now going to go back on the market after having a failed transaction. That's probably not going to look best. I think honestly, the best way forward with us is to do what we've contractually agreed to you know, in the beginning and just do that. And that is probably the least, the path of least resistance for you to get to where you want to be. And it's that next chapter of your life. Let's move on past this. Let's, let's get you out of this. Let's move forward. No. Is it a percentage point off what you thought you were versus what you were going to get? Yeah, maybe. But the overall perspective is let's move forward. It's much better to do this than to do the opposite. But the quick church, quick Twitch reaction was to do something crazy and aggressive and kill the deal. So we like to just kind of slow things down. Let's talk about this. Let's really rehash this in a little bit more of a positive light. And then we can come to a nice, sound, logical conclusion. That to me is the, the biggest one there. And then after sale services, realtors continue to provide support and assistance to their clients after the transaction is complete. Referrals to trusted service providers, assisting with post-closing issues, and maintaining long-term relationships for future real estate needs. I'm happy to say that most of my, my business uh, is referrals from past clients. I love to do a good job for my clients because I tell them, hey, look, my goal isn't just to sell you this house. I could. I could just sell you this house and say bye to you and never talk to you again. But I would love to do business with the people you know. I obviously did business with you because I liked you. There's plenty of buyers that I've worked with one time. I showed them a couple of houses or I had a meeting and I said, hey, I'm going to be really honest. I, I'm not interested in working with you. Like you seem really just not nice. You don't seem, I'm not saying quite this to their face, right? But I'm just, 
hey, I don't think your expectations are aligned. I don't think we're going to work well together. So the people that I actually work with, I've made a conscious decision to say, you know what? I don't have to work with this person. I want to work with this person. And if I want to work with you, I'm hoping that there are other people in your world that I might want to work with as well. So that's kind of what we get to with the after sale services. Other than that, I think the best thing that a realtor can do to continue is look, on average, people buy a home basically one every seven to 10 years. You know, the, the stats are kind of changing. People are staying in a little bit longer. We're with you for 30 to 45 days, maybe two months in the, for that, that first time. And then 10 years go by and then we're there for 30 to 45 days. That's not a lot of time in the span of seven to 10 years. So what is that agent doing for you in between? in between when you purchase all the way up to when you are are they giving you constant information about how the market is are they giving you vendor referrals are they inviting you to client events are they doing things where they can make sure they show up in your life in a positive way to help you or anything like that that's what i would say is look realtors at the end of the day we are we stand for service like wispus right we are here to service the clientele that we bring into our world and we're really happy to do so and we want to make sure we do that not just during the transaction during transaction management but all parts of your life, all part of real estate, right? It is a core function that we all need. We need shelter. This thing is important and it's complicated. We should be there as your advocate constantly. All right, I've taken enough of your time for today, but I really wanted to just highlight just some of this little bit about what you should expect out of your realtor. Again, if you have any questions on this or if you think there's anything maybe you can add to this, uh, I'm happy to hear about it. Shoot me a text, post on one of my videos. We'll go from there. All right, y'all, have a nice uh, week. We'll see you second week of February. Bye.